last year? 1948. What happened is immediately they entered into a war where the surrounding nations said, we don't like what the UN did, we want to destroy you. They won. Then in 1967 they had another war. Six day war. Six day war, exactly. And they won. And they got territory. And they said, hey, you know what, we'll give this territory back to you, even though you un un illegally attacked us, we'll give it back to you. But we, even Jerusalem, even parts of Jerusalem, we just want peace. We want you to sign a peace treaty. They said, forget it. We won't have peace for any reason with Jerusalem. So they kept the territory. So what the, what the world is now calling, quote unquote, occupied territory, is territory that they were willing to give back as long as the nations surrounding them would sign a peace treaty. So they're not giving it back because they didn't sign a peace treaty, even though they still have allowed uh, multiple, uh, you know, the, the Palestinians and the refugees, by the, which is a completely fabricated, yeah. uh, completely fabricated uh, problem. There was no Palestine. The Jewish people started to return to the, to the, the, the land in the late, in the mid 1800s, in the 1830s, and 1820s. They legally bought the land. A lot of the Jewish people. Even at three and four times the, the price, even though they bought swamp land that was absolutely no good and not, not good for anybody, they <coughs> transformed it based on God's favor and the prophetic word and, and, and turned it around. And it was only, and nobody had any problem with them buying the land and living there until they actually had, they were a, a nation with a sovereign influence in the middle of that region. So again, it's, it's uh, number one, it's spiritual. God's blessing upon them, and the devil is just sending out to attack them. So read Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 11. So while they were living there, God, knowing that they're going to come back through the prophet, knowing they're going to be brought back in the middle of nations that don't like them, prophesies the prophet, prophesies this. There's a judgment of the nations um, uh, regarding them. In verse 11, it says this: as for the Lord will. The Lord will be awesome to them, for he will reduce nothing to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place, and indeed all the shores of the nation. Let's go back. Is that right? Is that Zephaniah 2.11? Or 12.11? No, no. Let me read the whole text. Let me read the text. version other than the New King James Version Bible? Like an NIV? Huh? Yeah, maybe it's, uh, well, 4 through, I'm actually looking at verse 11, because basically the gist of it is, uh, maybe 10 and 11, uh, that the nations that surround them, as long as they are in agreement with Israel, God's going to let them live there, and the nations that are opposed to them, they're going to suffer and be uprooted. Uh, that's what I'm kind of looking for, and that's what I was reading, and I'm wondering if I wrote the so the Lord will be awesome to them, for he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place, indeed all the shores of the nation. See, I don't get that from this, and I just read it, so I'm, I must have... 28, 8 through 11. Yeah. Holly, maybe read 8 through 11, if you would. Yes. Who insulted my people and made threats against their land. Therefore, surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, surely Moab will become like Saddam, the, Adam, the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. The remnant of my people will plunder them, the survivors of my nation will inherit their land. This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. The Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all the gods of the land, the nations on every shore will worship him, everyone in his homeland. Yes, okay. So the context, there, that gives the full context there. That those that taunt Israel in the land, they're going to be destroyed. They'll be made like Sodom and Gomorrah. And those that do, they're going to see the God of Israel, and they're going to be converted because they're going to honor Israel. That's the gist of it. I just only read a part of it. Thank you. Please do. Ask all the questions you want. Um, because it's, yes, I understand this, but at the same time, I also see, like, even the war 
recently, a couple years ago in the summer, and you know, they, the Israelites, they mow the lawn, so to speak. And mm -hmm. I believe that there's a lot of people that are Palestinians or whatnot that really are, they're, um, you know, they were raised whatever way they haven't had the choice or the opportunity to have the choice yet. And I think that they're victimized still by some of the Israelites or at least the army or whatnot. So, I mean, I just don't know. There's so much evidence to show that there are, and you know, no one's perfect. It, this is not what I'm saying, but at the same time, I'm just, it's either like one side or the other I hear. It's like so pro-Israel that I feel like people are blind to what is actually happening, or so pro-Palestinian that it's the same thing. It's like they don't see. So, and my, my daughter is half Palestinian, so I see her people, you know, some of her family are caught in this, or they live in Gaza, and they, they live in you know, Gaza. yeah, so I just, um, <laughs> yeah. I just want to bring the voice up, because Absolutely. for me, like, God isn't one who terrorizes, and, you know, so I'm just like, God, how does that fit, because when we look at the reality, yeah, I understand what you're talking about, oh, prophecies, yeah. but at the same time, it's like, there's still innocent people dying, and I get it, it's both sides, but the Israelites kind of hold the upper hand with their weapons, and and they do. There's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of like mass bombings, and you know you could, of course, like I said, you can, you can say that for both sides. But at the same time, there's retaliation. You know that's done in a very powerful way. So I don't know. Sometimes when I hear all this pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian, I just kind of it gets me upset. <laughs> you know, or like I don't understand. I get a little bit confused because I still understand that people are suffering on both sides. You know. Yeah. So and we're, we're, what's, our, what's our salvation? What's our focus? What's our focus as the body of Christ? Jesus. Jesus. I'm going to talk about Iran, and I'm going to tell you that even though American politics, just as an example, we'll get to that concept. It's very important to keep Jesus at the center of everything that we're talking about from our perspective. It doesn't take away the sovereign uh, prophetic plan of God, but in the middle of it, the church, until he takes us out, we have a voice to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, remember that the media that we are in here, we're hearing is uh, a small portion of 15 to 20 media outlets are owned by 5 to 15 families. And they're, despite whether one says they're conservative or one says that they're uh, liberal, and, and, and what they're labeled on the outside, it's the same. It may be a different hand, but it's the same distraction. Don't look at this in here in the middle. This is what we're all subject to revival happening in the middle of the threat of that nation and in the middle of persecution. And we're not seeing what we see ISIS doing in Damascus to Christians and, um, um, and, uh, and uh, other minor minority groups in the area. It's not all Christians, but it's a large part of the of, um, cultural Christians that are there. Um, but in Iran, it's underground, and they believe that it's, it is the fastest growing church in the face of the planet right now. And, and, and nobody would want to go to war so God has a way, the Bible, and I'm going to tell you that there's a way that looks like God's going to deliver his people. Um, and there, when I talk about the war of Elam, the, the word out is they're waiting for that prophecy to come to pass. So the, the, the prophecy says that they're free. There's a, there's a revelation of, of them being able to get out of the captivity of the nation of Iran. I would have, again, I, you obviously with a, a daughter who's got a Palestinian heritage knows a lot more than what I know. But I know that... Um, that in Israel, you know, when I was there, and, and mostly there's there's Palestinian Arabs, that some that are allowed to be citizens, there's there's Arab Israelis, and there's Palestinian uh, Arabs that are allowed to work uh, in there. Um, uh, so, you know, and I remember the guy, the shopkeeper, and I bought my shofar horn and stuff from him when I was down there, and I we talked over the days that we were in the hotel in Jerusalem, and and um, oh yeah, and and my friend tried to draw me in. He's like, you know, like we got a witness to this guy, you know. And I'm like, I, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not just gonna go up and start beating the guy. How many Christians come here and try to hammer that guy? I just didn't feel it in. So he goes, oh, here, Rick will tell you. He gets, he starts the conversation and hands it off to me, and I'm like, it's a little <laughs> awkward, <laughs> you know. So I, I forget the guy's name, but I said, well, you know, I, I changed the subject. I said, how are you? I asked him a personal question because he was already drawn. He was very sarcastic, very flippant, very short in his response. So the other conversations were good and whatever and blah blah blah, and um, and I said, well, I, I don't know how where we got on this conversation. I just asked him. I said, oh, because he kept bringing his kids with him to work. His, the kids were everywhere, you know, and his sons. And I said, oh, he goes, okay, you got a great family. He goes, yeah, I'm missing one. I said, oh, 
well, where is he? Yeah, whatever. He died. I said, oh, oh my gosh, what happened? Well, he had a kite stuck in an electrical thing, and he tried to climb up and get it when he was five, and he got electrocuted and killed. And I said, oh, man, tragedy is difficult. And I, then I told him the story how my wife got a uh, tumor, and it was turning into cancer, and she had to lose her leg. And, and he goes, well, I just turned it over to God. And I said, you know, I did too. And I know his God is a lot. You know, it was a false God according to the Bible. But I said, can I pray for you? He said, yeah. And I prayed. So in the middle of this, in the middle of what this is, in the middle of the policies, and yeah, giving a potentially the blind eye and a, and a carte blanche, I mean, it's no nation is perfect. But there is, um, you know, subject <coughs> to the idea that I've been subject to a lot of that propaganda, but having been there, it, there's a, there, there is a cultural divide. And if you're Israeli in Israel, you get a lot better treatment than if you're not Israeli, you know. But again, um, they do get, they get bombed on a constant basis. You know, there's bomb shelters, there, there's horns, there's pull over, there's, there's, there's a fear in that, inside that culture. Um, but we're talking about big picture prophecies, but we also have a personal commission by the Lord Jesus Christ to communicate the gospel. That being the case, we're in those days. You know, I don't know that I have an answer to you mostly a comment and observation that you're making, but, but I do know that it's recognized, and I do know that, um, especially when you're closer to an issue than a lot of people, um, it would be really intimate. But our job is the church. Our job is the blood of Christ to communicate that. Because um, there won't be peace. According to the Bible, there will simply not be peace until Jesus comes back. When we're dealing with Allah, we're dealing with Zeus, we're dealing with Apollo or Dionysius, we're dealing with false gods and false religious systems. And because we know, uh, and I say it like this too, and we know when I'm witnessing, let's bring it down just to a regular witnessing, when I'm witnessing to a Jehovah Witness, and they're like, and you show them in the Bible how their Bible is different than our Bible, and you, you can't get past them, and you show them, you know, step by step, this is what the Bible says, this is the truth. At some point, the Lord gave me revelation. I'm not dealing with this man's understanding of the Scripture. I'm dealing with his relationship with his grandmother who loved him when his parents abandoned him. And he has the love of a grandma who was a Jehovah Witness. And if I tell him the Jehovah Witness is wrong, somehow in the emotional being, he has to reject grandma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See? So we're dealing with deeper issues that the yeah. demonic spirits are yeah. grabbing hold of the emotional being. Yeah. So you can't just so hit them with, quote the scripture, you know, and pal, you better just yeah, repent yeah. or yeah. off with your so head. But we're dealing with something a lot deeper than that. And that is the emotional attachment, the family, the genuine human love that we've been given naturally by God to deliver. And we need to take that into consideration when we're doing this. But it doesn't take away God's sovereign plan. But somehow in the middle of the sovereign plan, we have the power of the Holy Ghost to minister truth in the middle of these situations. Amen. So So that, that is, you know, this is why we are... The ministry of what? Reconciliation. Yes. And when people say, Jesus came to bring peace on earth, it wasn't peace between nations. There will never be peace between nations. Because all the false gods, I could do a whole teaching on um, digression. The Tower of Babel. Is this okay? Of course. Following it? Yeah. This is important. At the Tower of Babel, when, when Nimrod made the tower to the sky, it was going to, the, the Babel, Babylon means gate of heaven. He was trying to get to heaven. He was, he was right. yeah. following. And the demonic spirits were there. And it says in Deuteronomy, Moses says, that as God destroyed the, the, the tower, he sent them off according to the, to the gods, to the number of the gods. And some versions of the Bible says according to the children of Israel. But that doesn't make sense because in Babylon there was no children of Israel. There was no, Abraham hadn't been called out yet. But in, in certain manuscripts, it says according to the number of the gods, which was 70. He became, they made 70, uh, there were 70 countries, 70 people groups that dispersed. If you follow that out, they went to different areas. And what that, what Moses said is that God said, and I will keep, I will keep Israel, I will call out of that, which Abraham was called shortly after that event, I will keep out of that my people, I will call Abraham, I will call it, you know, Abraham and make him mine and my people out of here. And you 70 false gods, fallen angels, go ahead and take your people, go out there. And he basically turned the peoples who were in rebellion to him anyway over to the gods. How many of you know you get what you vote for? Yeah. 
you're voting to take over heaven, God's going to give you the one that you're working for. Yeah. And that's got the current political application today as well. Really? So, <laughs> but as you, as you, and you go to those places, now watch, this is really fascinating. I don't have the material to, to sort of evidence it to you, but I'll, I'll just expound this and we'll move on. That they went, the Bible documents 70 places, 70, basically 70 people groups that were developed out of that. And in the middle of that, he calls Abram. Now, pass by a couple of thousand years and you have Jesus, and then you have Paul the Apostle getting saved. If you overlay Paul's missionary journeys with, so in other words, and he turned them over, so you have uh, the Greek gods, the Egyptian gods, you have all the different god systems that were developed in all these cultures that weren't the one true God. And they have uh, remnants of the truth of, the, of Genesis up until the Tower of Babel and the flood. They have remnants of that in all these cultures. But they don't have the full truth, which was maintained through the lineage of Abram and God's people, Moses, and, and so forth. So when ultimately Jesus comes and then Paul comes, when you overlay and look at his three missionary journeys, Paul went, this is fantastic, Paul's journeys went to every single one of those territories that the Babylonians, that the false gods in those territories went to. So God sent the blood of Christ to redeem what those false gods couldn't satisfy in each of those cultures, to draw them back out and unto himself to say, your God didn't do it, and I gave you thousands of years to do this. Now now I'm going to come and redeem you by, by my blood. Hallelujah. This is a spiritual conflict that we're in the middle of. It's a cosmic chess match. We're not pawns. We are the army uh, implementing the plans of our Heavenly Father. And, so, and what's at stake? Not land and boundaries and territories, but souls and minds and families. People. To be redeemed, to become the bride of Christ, or the redeemed of the Lord, to be in intimacy with Him forever. So I, 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 I am compassion and empathy on the struggles of these issues. Um, but again, it's the wisdom of God's Holy Spirit that would allow us to navigate these. Um, but these are, I can't get around it, these are sovereign uh, prophecies that God will use Israel. At some point in this game, we know that 80%, maybe even 90% of Israel is absolutely non-religious. But they're not. There's a small portion that's even Orthodox Jew and a small portion that's Orthodox or even cares about these things. Um, at some point, as Paul is longing for, and as the Bible prophesies, they will receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah and become a, 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 a nation that literally follows Christ as the Messiah in that capacity. But they're going to go through. They're going to, and the tribulation, by the way, is not the tribulation of everybody. It is, the, it is a seven-year judgment for Israel. Because it's a seven-year judgment they've yet to receive that they skipped out on once Messiah was crucified. It's Jacob's trouble. It's the tribulation. It's, it's the wrath of, of God poured up on the land of Jacob. It's not upon the whole world. The whole world, i.e., that the Antichrist's focus is going to be in that area to destroy God's people because of his hatred for God. So, again, it's not going to be a pretty place. And that's why Jerusalem will become the uh, stumbling block uh, to, the, to the people. But God will still keep his promise to them. Um, and I think God's fair enough not to allow innocent... Well, life is tough. You know, God's sovereign plan are gonna, is going to get uh, pulled out in the middle of that. Thank you for that question. I'm not afraid of any thoughts or questions. So the Spirit of the Lord takes care of business. Donna? So is there a, a division of Jewish right now? You said that they're, that they're not religious. Um, and I'm seeing that there's a Zion group, there's this group, that group, the Jewish people who have certain beliefs, and then there's the Christian Jews mm -hmm. that actually also support the church right now. There, when well, I, just my trip to Israel, there's extremely Orthodox Jews, and they don't. If you're not Jewish, you know. I went up to the wall and I just prayed. And I I had a really, I got lost. And I almost lost my group because I started praying, and then I looked up. I went up there when there was nobody there, and the sun was headed down, and I, and I look up and I'm, I'm like getting bumped over the way because these, these the, the more ornate dressed the Jewish people were, the more they shoved me out of the way. I was in their spot. So I I don't know. I just kept getting shoved away. I would close my eyes and pray, and I'd wake up way over here in the corner somewhere. You know, uh, and, and they were crazy. And, and, and I'm, I'm like, it was it was very ecstatic, very religious, very uh, there there is no value in the Jewish form of faith at this point. The God that they serve is not. I won't say he's not the God of the Bible, but he's not the Messiah. Yeah. The revelation of what they had was supposed to point to Jesus. If yeah. you knew me, 
or you're not Moses and you're not Abraham. Well, if you knew Moses, if you understood Moses, if you understood Abraham, you'd know who I was because I, you know, I'm the one who talked to them. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the manifestation of the fulfillment of that prophetic word. So they're missed, they missed the boat. They're maintaining a religious form that has absolutely no value, any less, any more than Islam does at this point. Yeah. Um, it doesn't take away, you know, that the Jewish people were supposed to honor them as the heritage of that and to, to bless to bless Israel. Israel is going to expand, prophetically speaking. Israel is going to grow, and they will become saved and born again. But they are divisions. And even in the Orthodox community, there's levels of orthodoxy, levels of commitment. And, yeah, and all manner of things. Um, so, and then most most of them have a form of faith. And there's a lot of believers, there's a lot of Christians in, in Israel right now. In fact, there's a huge revival of Christianity. You can't preach, but you can have meetings and talk about it. You can't, you know, so there's things that are happening. Uh, but again, most of them are not religious. And mostly, if you visited, if you ever visit the Holocaust Museum, you'd understand why most of them don't believe in God anymore. You know, and why they don't like Christians. Because most of them, the church allowed that. The church persecuted them all these years. And, 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 so, and so God abandoned me, so why should I care about God? That's the mindset. Yeah. As I experienced it. And as I heard from some of the Jewish people there. Same way they feel like that in Athens, it was the largest Jewish population in Europe before World War II. Athens was. Athens was. Now it's New York. And now they have less than 2,000. And when you go to the Holocaust Museum and they start explaining this, the bitterness against the Christians that allowed it is just, wow. it drips. And some of them, the church participated in. Yes. Christians claim it from, from Calvin, Luther, uh, uh, you know, all the way through the, they were kicked out of Spain in 1492, you know, but there's a lot of, just as a people group, that I had, but God maintained their identity and he's bringing them back again. So, um, political, political maneuverings over there, that's, that's a tough one, <coughs> um, but. So, I know someone. Oh, sure. Yeah, we'll get to our study something. <laughs> what about the church now? I mean, I've been trying to talk to pastors about the end times and why aren't they listening? And, and for a while I was in the mindset that, oh, the tribulation's coming. We have to go get our food, our yeah. storage, our stuff like that. And I'm like, don't you want to do something? But that's a concept that's just throwing me off as well. So why isn't that... Uh, well, again, I think this teaching is included in the scripture. I think Peter talks a lot about it. Was, uh, the first couple nights, we talked about how in the, the very fact that in the last days scoffers will come. Jesus has been saying he's coming back for all these years, and why do we pay attention to it? The fact that there's a mockery of the last days or the days that we're in, that in itself is a fulfillment of prophecy according to the Apostle Peter. Yes. Uh, and, and people, yeah, even people claiming to be Christians. A form in the last days, so perilous times will come. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1, in perilous times, that means crazy, violent, um, uh, wicked times on the face of the planet. And then he goes on to list a series of those things. Uh, but it says in the last days, and the word last days means in the last of the last days. The last days began when Jesus came to the planet on the earth, and he began to prophesy. That's when it began, the last days. Uh, and then... But now, Paul says, in the last of the last days. He, he breaks that down to say at the very end. So I believe we're in those, those time frames. But again, um, it's a message. And prophecy comes under attack. And I'll, especially when we're talking about the rapture. <coughs> especially um, all of the classic interpretations of Scripture are being turned on their head because of Islam or what people think Islam is, that the Antichrist will be Muslim. All of these different ideas, are, and it's really confusing people. I'm sticking what God has shown me, and um, but I don't mind entertaining all of the other theories and questions, but I'm going to, I've, I've, what I'm sharing with you, I'm not doing it off the cuff. I've studied it and taught it uh, for for years. I'm, I'm going on eight years of strictly studying prophecy at my church on Wednesday nights, and what you're getting is the culmination of that study and staying on top of that subject for an eight-year period every Wednesday night. Well, this is even refined. So and changed somewhat in certain beliefs. And Sally and Mike were in our, uh, From four years ago. Yeah. Oh. So, and again, I'm always learning and, and seeing the application. Yeah. 
Thank you, Holly. So, Zephaniah 2.11 basically says that those people who would honor Israel in that concept would be, would be blessed. And those that dishonor it would be uprooted, i.e. nation nationally. When you belong to a nation that dishonors God, it doesn't take away your personal ability to receive faith in Jesus Christ. Right. And just because you believe in faith in Jesus Christ does not mean America won't enter a civil war or be attacked by an enemy that causes distraction. We're not immune to any of that. That's not the tribulation. That's life. That's conflict. That's stuff happening. But, but we're not in the tribulation. The Bible says that the tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of God's wrath. Where was our wrath put? Upon the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. The wrath of God was poured out on him. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we that believe would become the righteousness of God in Christ. We are not going to be judged a second time for our sin. We don't have to go through difficult times to refine us. I've got enough difficult times. Huh? You know, just because we're not being crucified yet in our nation doesn't mean that it wouldn't happen. It doesn't mean that's God's wrath. That means that's persecution. We are not immune from persecution. We're just immune from God's wrath. The seven year period is a time of God's wrath and that's not for the church. Amen. So, Psalm 83. Let's get there. Get there. <laughs> 